Good evening. Blessed Wednesday evening to each and every one of you, Exact and Truth Body Fellowship members, and of course, the Exact and Truth landscape of Body Fellowship members across that fruited plain, the fellowship with us. Welcome to our Exacting Insight into the Word Wednesday Bible Study Facebook Live, where you bow your heads and pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for another day that your hand has made. We thank you for life, health, and strength. We thank you for food, shelter, and clothing. We thank you for provision and protection with regards to our family, our loved ones, our children, our neighbors, our friends, our co-workers, and even our enemies. We're asking that you come into this Bible study this evening. We're asking that you have your way. We're asking that you speak in our hearing. Let it be you and not we ourselves. And as we incline our ears, administer grace to every hearer and allow us to leave the better for coming, no longer the same. We're asking that you allow your power to manifest itself and that you rest, rule, and abide over all things. We're asking that you order our steps once again this evening. We're asking that you remember the truly poor today, the sick and shut in. We're asking that you remember those who need remembering everywhere, those who are fearful, skeptical, unbelieving, those who may even be deep compressing from the faith because of man's hypocrisy and dogma and sacrilege and just aberrant walk with regards to your will and way. We thank you for last Saturday Sabbath powerful word online. We thank you for the blessing and the dedication of the, many of the children of Exactly Truth Ministries back to you. We're asking that you receive them, that you cover them and protect them. And we're asking that you cover and protect us all, that uh, we're not just baptized by water and that we're not just convinced by word of mouth, but that we are transformed by the indwelling of your Holy Spirit. And once again, we're asking that you remember those who need remembering, those who may even be grieving. We're living in a pivotal time. We're living in a tumultuous age. There are so many people that are suffering loss. And irrespective of what that loss may be, we're asking that you sup and dine with them, that you uh, just present yourself in their lives and that uh, you offer comfort. And we're asking once again all these blessings and many more in that great name, Yeshua, Yehoshua, Hamashiach, the Christ name we pray. Amen. Well, good evening, everyone. Prayerfully, you're blessed. Prayerfully, you're joyful and you're encouraged. We're praying for each and every one of you. For those of you all who may join us for the first time, whether it be it, whether it be live now or whether it be at a later date, perusing at your own convenience. My name is uh, Solaire Arman Jr. and we're shepherd and leading emissary at Exact and Truth Ministries in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And uh, we welcome you. Huh. We're just blessed. We're coming to the close of another year. It's been a challenging one. Still a lot of challenges taking place around the globe. And it's going to be that way, beloved, because we believe that we are actually living in the latter days and the end times and we must prepare ourselves and we must be equipped and we do that by reading studying observing the holy writ the words that were left on record for our learning there's great amounts of prophecy that have been left through the annals of history left on record through the ages certainly coming to pass very clearly to prepare us for what is to come. There's no excuse for us to be unprepared. And so this evening is no different. We're going to delve into the Holy Writ. We're glad that you're here once again. Don't take for granted that you're studying with us. You could be studying anywhere. So uh, we're going to get ready to dive into this thing, unpack what the Most High have given us. We got a lot to say in a short period of time. So if you would, please, if you have the capability to join us in the Hebrew book, one of the books of the prophets, in fact, in uh, the 66 codices, it's the final book of prophecy in the Hebrew scriptures. Malachi, we're going to be reading Malachi chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. And if you have the capability of joining me in the new international version of the English translation, I'd be much obliged. Here it is, the reading of the Holy Writ. Malachi chapter 3, verses 1 through 4, New International Version, NIV, and it reads as thus, beloved, I will send my messenger 
Now, this is prophetic or a word of now be if you're looking at it from an original Hebrew context. Now be being a word that we view transliterally as the word prophecy now. I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. Then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant whom you desire will come, says the Lord Almighty. But who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he will be like a refiner's fire or a launderer's soap, my Lord. He will sit as a refiner and purify, purifier of silver. He will purify the Levites and refine them like gold and silver. Then the Lord will have men who will bring offerings in righteousness, my Lord. And the offerings of Judah and Jerusalem will be acceptable to the Lord as in days gone by, as in former years. Hallelujah. May the Most High add a blessing and uh, may the Most High add an enriching to the reading of the Holy Writ this evening. Beloved, the title of our text this evening is simply Refinement. This evening, I'm going to begin our message with a statement that would actually be fitting if it were the very last thing mentioned in summing up the entire sermon. So in essence, we're going to begin with the end. Now, this isn't the first time that we've chosen to minister in this fashion. If some of you have been following our ministry for a period of time, and we're going to make a statement that would be fitting to close this lesson this evening right now. And that statement is, do not give up because this is only the beginning. Do not give up because more than likely, I don't care how long you claim to be saved. It's an excellent chance. The Holy Spirit is poured and deposited into us and we're pouring out on you and we're informing you that despite that tenure, don't give up irrespective of how it looks and what you're going through, because this is only the beginning. What seems like or appears to be, in many cases, and quite possibly in so many of our lives currently, overwhelming failure, or at this period of time and point and juncture in your life, what has manifested as profound personal inadequacies can actually be the results which manifest from a process of the Most High's mercy and unmerited, unearned favor that have been designed or has been rather designed to reveal our current makeup our current conditioning and fitness to serve in the capacity in which the Most High has both called us as well as chosen to position us. So yes, what Shepherd Man is saying in essence, beloved, is that you need to hang in there because although you may be experiencing what can be contrived as failure, although you may be recognizing uh, some insufficiencies, some inadequacies, oftentimes what these things are, they are byproducts of the refinement process. And what you are experiencing is the separation 
of the things that the Most High desires and seeks to remove from your life and to separate them from the potential that's going to be left over that has been called, chosen, and elected to expedite his will and his purpose for the betterment and for the expansion of his kingdom down here on earth. Hallelujah. Beloved, what you very well may be experiencing is not your end. You may be experiencing what it feels like and what it looks like to go through refinement. The definition of the verb refine in the English lexicon is to free from impurities, to purify from what is coarse, to purify from what is vulgar or debasing. It means, in essence, beloved, to make elegant or cultured. In order to be elegant, in order to be cultured, in order to be well-spoken, in order to be well-respected and affirmed in the gates, as it were, or amidst uh, your peers, then there is a necessity for the things that would counteract that or that would buck up against your success to be purified or refined from your circumstance. So those things that are coarse, those things that are vulgar, if you are to be eloquent, then you have to be refined from the things that are vulgar, preventing the eloquence. The process to refine impure metal, for example, is called metallurgy, which involves the technique or science of working or heating metals. Heating metals, beloved. <laughs> so that precious minerals, valuable alloys, and useful objects may be extracted via intense heat and then reconstituted from the original metallic ores into something of immense value. For instance, if I can give you an example as an analogy that we experience as human beings. Mankind often struggles from the failure to compute several extremely critical variables involved in the deciphering of results being manifested from choices that we've made and the directions that we've chosen to pursue. So we end up in these predicaments, beloved, but we misread and miscalculate not only the outcomes that are to be derived from these circumstances, but we come to a place and we arrive at an instance in our lives where that's the only result that we can have which is a lack of understanding because we fail to understand what the circumstance is for. What the motive of the circumstance is for in the first place. So, we end up struggling to compute and to deduce why we're in the circumstances that we're in. And so thus we're going to fail to decipher what we are designed to grasp from these circumstances. Let me ask you a question. Can one seriously imagine or envision a place where you would actually be frustrated, become depressed, and or dejected in spite of the fact that you are in possession 
of priceless art and antiquities. What kind of question is that? I thought you were talking about that we don't have the capability to be able to understand sometimes the circumstance that we end up in and exactly why we're in that circumstance. Listen, beloved, yes, this is the perfect metaphor and analogy because what we're trying to articulate this evening is that we're missing the forest for the trees. And the enemy, our adversary, high Satan, is tricking so many people into giving up, throwing in the towel, or possibly just allowing their situations to degrade or become worse. Because you don't recognize the difference between a defeat and the process that you're being refined. So we need to liken it unto someone that would be upset, disheveled, and just frustrated despite the fact that they're in possession of priceless art and antiquities. Some of y'all are like, I can't relate because my life and what I'm going through and what I've suffered, well, I've never done that simultaneously being in ownership or in possession of something super valuable that could change my whole dynamic. Are you sure? <laughs> who would have ever imagined or who can like picture being a person in possession of, let's say, the Mona Lisa, for example, something that is highly regarded over an elongated period of time as being a piece of art of incalculable worth or say Michelangelo's David for example who would have ever imagined or who can perceive that a person in possession of such valuable art could end up profoundly miserable and dissatisfied despite the fact that they must obviously be of incredible worth because the things that they're holding to man is of incalculable worth. Well, one commonly overlooked scenario that often goes unrealized when someone possesses something which has been assessed with incredible value is the actual cost of maintenance required to preserve it and to preserve its value over time. Simply what we're saying, beloved, is sometimes we, well, all of the times, because we have life, and if we've been called, and if we've been elected by the Most High, then we have purpose, and we have a destiny that can't be quantified with earthly or corporeal worth. You can't put a number on our value, yet so many of us are extremely miserable. So many of us are just in the doldrums, sad, unhappy, despite the position of faith and the knowledge thereof that we hold. One of the reasons why that is, beloved, is we'll come into the possession of something valuable, but we won't properly come to understand exactly what it takes to maintain that valuable thing that the Most High have placed in our possession. So rather than it serve and appear as a blessing, or rather than it manifest the true value and worth that it has in our lives, it begins to become a burden. So think about it. You have the Mona Lisa, but think about how many people want the Mona Lisa. And think about what it's going to take to maintain the Mona Lisa in your possession. So oftentimes that premise is overlooked, what it takes to maintain and to preserve that which is a value that has been placed in your hands. Arriving at the complete realization of the work and the endurance of the trials required to preserve and protect that priceless thing that you're in possession of. Once you have been placed in a position of ownership or guardianship, 
I think some of you all are grasping the gist of where we're going, but hang in there. We're going somewhere else. So stay with me. Another poorly understood dynamic of our reality oftentimes is when a person finds themselves and follow me in a position of a thief. Now, one person outright legally owns the Mona Lisa or Michelangelo's David, but say you stole it, pulling off the heist of the century, and now you're in possession of the Mona Lisa or Michelangelo's David or something of that value, and you're trying to see how it is going to affect and manifest your destiny moving forward, how it's going to enrich you, because after all, you have acquired something that is considered of immense value. Now, stealing the painting or the bust of David is one thing, but extricating value from these rare pieces after they've been stolen, well, that's contingent upon your ability to fence or to sell on the black market these pieces of art and to attempt to derive somewhere near its original and current value. You possibly know that you're not going to get what it's fully worth and what it's fully comprised of because you've got to break off the people who are fencing it. You've got to avoid the, authority, the authorities and so on. So... In the case of something that has been stolen, you hope to extract some value close to what the full value is. But you've got to fence it first. And fencing it is no simple task because the entire world has been alerted to the theft of the art, meaning the whole world is looking for what has been stolen. And your future happiness is contingent upon your ability not just to sell the stolen items to the highest bidder and to do that discreetly, but to also do it without being brought under arrest by the authorities that are looking for you. Now, why are you saying all this, Shepard, man? What is the gist and the point? Have you ever felt like hiding? Because it seems as though the whole world has been let in on the fact that you're messing up in your situation, similar to the whole world looking for a stolen painting <laughs> of high profile. Have you ever felt like hiding because your recent choices have placed your life as well as the lives of those that live in close proximity to you in trouble or in jeopardy? It can seem like a spotlight is shining directly on your struggles and on the things that you're encountering at the very time that, in essence, is the least likely time or the least favorable time that you would desire any type of attention or a light shining on your circumstance. Anybody ever gone through that? I know I've been through things like that in my life. Just when it seems like that your marriage is on the rocks, it seems like that everybody is paying attention to it. Just when it seems like that your relationships are going awry, it seems like that that's when everybody is in your business or, you know, at the least time that you want somebody to ask you how you're doing, that's when everybody seems to notice that you're going through something. It can seem like you're being filmed live on camera, for instance, when you're failing at a job assignment or failing at your schoolwork or failing to pass tests of proficiency. It can seem like the very time where you want to garner the least attention, that's when you're garnering the most attention. And what is our reaction and what is our response to this type of stimuli? We want to avert the attention away from us or we want to escape from these circumstances that we found ourselves, that we find rather ourselves in. Okay, that makes sense, Shepherd Man. Well, I'm getting ready to tell you something that seems counterintuitive to that sense. I'm going to tell you that oftentimes it's not for us to divert attention 
And it's not for us to try to find a way to escape out of these circumstances. One of the reasons why you feel the way that you feel is because you have been placed specifically in the circumstance. And the circumstance is bringing the pain and the detriment that you're feeling to the surface. Not only so that it ultimately can be separated from your circumstance and you can be free. But beloved, if you were not placed in the circumstance in the first place, you would never be fully aware that what is in you can lead you to, to such circumstances in the first place. All believers who say that they believe stand on the fundamental principle that faith is rewarded. We say that we have faith, but beloved, we don't have faith for nothing. <laughs> if we're honest and if we're astute with regards to how our spirituality works, then we recognize that we put on faith, but we put on faith ultimately so that our faith can be rewarded. We as believers don't simply place our hope and trust in the belief that something we cannot empirically see will never tangibly manifest. We don't pray and live a life of consecration so that ultimately there's never a heaven or a new Jerusalem. How many people are in this thing just for the passage of time? No, we believe that our faith is going to be rewarded. We believe that our hope and our expectation in the Most High is going to be rewarded. So we don't do this for nothing. Rather, the hope and the expectation which fuels our faith is rooted in the confidence and assurance that our faith will transform into exactly what we believed it would be prior to our ability to see it tangibly. However, what many individuals, all of this is getting ready to come together, what many individuals often fail to realize is that tests, tests <laughs> are required both and not only required, but they're also utilized by the Most High in order to determine a truthful and accurate measurement of an individual's faith and of their degree of trust as well as our levels of determination. So what the Most High does is that he places us in tests and trials in order to determine these things. In Malachi chapter three, verse four, I believe, the word for refine is the Hebrew word sawraf. And what sawraf means is a test or a trial by utilizing the smelting or refinement process in order to prove. So we're in these situations and it appears as though we're failing in these situations. We're in these situations and it appears as though these situations are revealing nothing but brokenness. We're in these tests and trials and it appears as though we're on our last leg and it's getting the best of us. And what we don't realize is the woe that we feel, the failure that we feel is the most high's refinement testing process, bringing all of the impurities to the surface and make no mistake about it. The test exposes these levels, degrees, and measurements to each and every individual that is being tested in order to bring them, listen, beloved, to self-awareness. The Most High already knows where we're at and what we're composed of. Most of the time, we ourselves, listen, are the very ones that are either in denial or completely in the dark altogether regarding what is operating in us or the actual elements, whether they be good or bad, 
that we've been constructed from. In other words, to simplify this, beloved, you don't know who you are until you're tested. And if, we're, and if it were not for the test or being placed directly in a trial or amidst conflict and suffering, we would never truly or fully realize what is in us, whether that be bad as well as good. We would never truly realize what is in us. And we would never truly realize exactly where our faith or our basis of belief lies. We would never fully comprehend, beloved, what we're constructed of. Never realize and never come to admit where we truthfully came from. And how can you be sure of the direction that you're headed in if you cannot be honest about where you began? In the Hebrew book of Daniel, and I'm preparing to close, chapter three, the three young devout Hebrew young men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who had been placed in positions of leadership because of their obedience to the Most High in concert with their brother Daniel in aiding the king in remembering and then interpreting his dream. They subsequently were placed in positions of governance amidst Babylon, despite being enslaved. But in chapter three, they were thrown into the ultimate test of their faith and beliefs due to the fact that they would not bow down to a statue of gold made by King Nebuchadnezzar II, in which he had erected an honor and tribute pretty much to himself. This test was manifested similar to metallurgy in the form of a fiery furnace that they were first bound and then thrown into to be burned to death because of their lack of compliance. Beloved, many of us spend a lifetime and often expend untold amounts of energy and waste all of our resources on efforts to avoid or escape the tests and trials in our lives that it is imperative and that we must certainly face. The issue with this premise, and I'm closing, is that if it were not for the fiery test, which appear to have the propensity to utterly destroy us, we would not know what we truly believe. We would not know the things in our spirit and character which have actually been detrimental to our survival in the first place. And most importantly, we would not be in the literal positions for the Most High to tangibly prove His presence and power in our lives. It was one thing for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to say that we will not bow. It was one thing for them to determine that if we have to die, if we have to burn, we're going to have to die, we're going to have to burn because we will not bow down to this idol and we will not disrespect the most high God of the Hebrews that have preserved us and that has preserved the nation of Judah until this point and until this time. So despite our lot today, we are going to stand fast and we are going to exercise our faith. It's one thing to say that, but beloved, when you're being bound and when the very people that have been tasked with binding you are burned up trying to get you in the fire, then I'm telling you that fire is going to tell something different to us. But the thing that we miss in life is that we live with an expectation that our faith is going to produce tangible results and is going to manifest in a way that not only we can see it, but other people can see the results of our faith. Christ said that you should let people see your good works so that ultimately they will glorify your most high father, which is in heaven. So let's not fool ourselves this evening 
This whole thing is designed and our whole expectation is designed that one day it's going to manifest where we can see it and it won't just be talk. It'll be evidence. So I'm telling you right now, you need not run from the fire because you need to get in the fire to receive your evidence. So what happened was when they were thrown in the fire, not only did they not burn, but the rescue of a fourth entity was witnessed standing up in the fire with them free from their fetters because it took them being rescued by an early example of the ancient of days coming to stand on their behalf it took them literally and dare I say physically watching their deliverance it didn't happen anywhere but in the trial and in the test of that furnace so this is what's happening, and let's let us recap and let us review. So I don't care what you say, Shepherd Man. I'm still not allowing nobody to throw me in no fire. You don't have to. You already in it. You already in it. Look at how some of our relationships have turned out to this point. You already in the fire. Look at how so many of us have been disenfranchised by the managing of our own resources and our fundings, our gifts and talents. You already in the fire. Look at some of our relationships with regards to our offspring and our family members. We're getting ready to go into a holiday season and some of you all are not looking forward to it because of the results that have occurred from your interaction with those who are supposed to be close to you. You don't have to worry about accepting and embracing the end end of this message, me encouraging you to get in the fire, you did, little did you know you already in the fire. But what I want to let you know is don't run from your circumstance because the thing that is so painful that you're experiencing, the thing that you're going through, the thing that you're asking for relief, and it doesn't seem like the most high hears you, it's not so much that that bad thing is going to overtake you. The fire is causing and the refining process is causing and the purification process is causing those things that you need not. Those things that do not need to follow you into the future. Those things that don't need to impair or hamper your life another day. That fire that you despise is bringing the stuff that you didn't even know was in you to the surface so that he can remove it for you from you so that you can realize the value of who you really are in him. You don't know how mean you are until you get into the refining process. You don't know how stubborn you are until he places you in the refinement process. Here we are thinking about divorce and you need to double down in your bad marriage because that bad marriage is not going to stay a bad marriage. I declare it today in faith because he has placed you in that marriage so that he can detach you not from your spouse, but detach you from the dangerous things that are part of yourself. Subsequently, he doesn't use Kool-Aid and ice cream to refine us. He refines us with fire so that the impurities can be separated from the valuable minerals that are valued by us all. Come to find out that the fulfillment of the promise to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came from them being placed in the most frightening circumstances that they could ever imagine. But guess what? They emerge from those circumstances whole with the evidence witnessed by all of those who witnessed that occurrence in that field that day where that statue was erected, that there was a literal fourth person that came to deliver them. Through the refinement process is the proving process. It's far beyond the witness that we could offer people with words because when they see the presence of the Holy Ghost manifesting through your life because you succeeded and graduated from your refinement. Well, that's more powerful than words. So I encourage you, and my time has become far spent, so I'm going to prepare to close. We're going to prepare to pray. But I'm going to ask you to hang in there through what you're experiencing. And what it appears as though you're suffering. Because, beloved, all of those sufferings don't equate to ruin. Some of those sufferings are designed to equate to completion. That's what the refinement process is. And I, I'm telling you today, beloved, you're being refined. You're being refined. 
How is it that the Lord would call me and then allow me to suffer so greatly? Because the things that you don't need to take on that journey to completion, he's got to get them out of you. And how can you volunteer to let them go if half of them you don't know are on the inside of you in the first place? Yeah, we think, we think that the value of art and antiquities are going to bring value to our lives. But who would have thought that if we converted into real life talk, who would have thought that the jobs, our dream jobs, or our dream relationships, or our dream families, or our dream locations, you know, or our dream expenditures, you know, you prayed for a house, now you get that house and the house is about to kill you. Mm -hmm. You can't afford to take care of it. You know, shingles coming off of the roof, floods coming up in the basement. Who would have thought that it would take so much to maintain the art that you thought would just enrich your life? Well, you got to realize that the burden of the art designed to enrich your life is actually a part of the refinement process to bring the impurities out of your life so that you can fulfill the most highest purpose for your life. Amen. I hope that ultimately this was a word that granted insight and encouraged so many of you all. Will you bow your heads and pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for such an astute and timely word. Truly, so many people felt as though they were drowning. And there is a tendency, I can imagine in that circumstance where you just want to give in and you want to just inhale the water and let be what is to come. But I want to encourage each and every person that feels like they're drowning today. You're not drowning. I want to encourage each and every person that feels like and that witnesses this lesson this evening, feel like that they're burning and that their very end is going to be consumed. That's not his purpose. That's not his design for you. His design is to purify you, but it takes an intense heat to separate what is designed to destroy us from the thing that is designed to preserve us. So we thank you, Father. Father, forgive us for doubt. Forgive us for <sighs> diminished faith. And we know and we won't be remiss to say that that forgiveness is nigh us. Help us to forgive one another by forgiving first ourselves. Scripture says that you are to love one another as you love yourself. How can we begin to forgive one another if we can't forgive ourselves? So forgiveness starts at home and home is not the domicile that protects us from the elements. Home is the temple that we provide for the Holy Spirit to indwell in us. Home is we ourselves. We are the ecclesia. We are what we call in this day and time the church. Help us to treat the church better. Then we can forgive those that we fellowship with, even in close proximity, even our neighbors, which is the closest one to you. Forgive us, Lord, and we know that that is nice because of the sacrifice of your son, the Hamashi on the cross that died but didn't stay dead is risen again and is alive right now, sitting on your right hand, making intercession for us, of which this message this evening is an example of said intercession. And we're asking that you save us, make us saved. As Paul wrote to the church at Rome in Romans chapter 10, verse 9, the, the original Greek word for that is sozos, which means to make us safe, meaning preserve us, keep us till such a time that you return for us so that we might live with you an infinite time. And we ask these blessings and many more in that great name, Yeshua, Yehoshua, Hamashiach, the Christ's name we pray. Listen, be encouraged. Don't shut off the refining process. <laughs> Don't run. I promise you, you're going to be better for the experience. There's something great coming out of the fire. Wow, that sounds like a message within itself. Be encouraged and meet us this Saturday for Saturday Sabbath at 1030 a.m. Until then, be blessed. I love you. There's not a whole lot you can do about it.